Hello, and welcome to the Equipping Godly Women podcast, where we challenge, encourage, and equip Christian women just like you to be all in in faith and family. Today on the podcast, we are speaking with author Jill Savage about her book, No More Perfect Marriages, Experience the Freedom of Being Real Together. Now, let me tell you, in today's interview, you are going to want to either get out a pen and a paper and be prepared to take notes or save this episode because this is one you're going to want to come back to again. I can tell you just having listened to it once, I will absolutely be going back and listening to this again. Jill shares so much great advice for wives and marriages that you are going to want to take notes. So whether you are brand new in your marriage and your marriage is going great, or whether you've been married for a long time and your marriage is really struggling, in today's interview, we are talking about some of the common reasons why marriages can start to fade over the years, what we need to watch out for, and how we can keep our marriages strong, whether that's strengthening an already good marriage or coming back from the brink of infidelity and divorce. Wherever you're at in your marriage, this is an episode that is going to be so encouraging and so practical for you. So definitely stay tuned. Well, today on the podcast, we are speaking with Jill Savage. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast today, Jill. Of course. Good to be with you. Well, will you start by telling us just a little bit about your background, both professionally and personally? I know we're going to be talking about your book, No More Perfect Marriages, today, but I know that's not the only book that you've written. You're not a first-time brand-new unknown author, so can you tell us a little bit about your background? Sure. Yeah, this is actually my 14th uh, I have 14 books, and so this one is the third in a series called the No More Perfect series. First was No More Perfect Moms, No More Perfect Kids, and then No More Perfect Marriages. So my um, professional background is uh, I became an accidental leader of an international mom's ministry. <laughs> And when I say accidental leader, I started uh, a, a mom's group in my community a uh, long, long, long time ago, and it just grew and grew and grew. And we eventually decided to do a mom conference, which we anticipated a few hundred people might come to. And uh, we had 1,100 women from 10 states that came to the very first one. So we kind of went wow, what in the world just happened? So um, that grew and grew and grew and grew. And I led that ministry for 24 years. And that's what really launched me into writing and speaking and um, eventually coaching as well, because uh, I uh, found that uh, books and, you know, could go places I couldn't. And so I love that possibility and I love what that brings. Um, Personally, I'm a mom of five, and three are married, and we have uh, seven grandchildren, um, which is like the best. We absolutely love it. Um, most of them live around us, and so we're grateful that we have the opportunity to influence their lives. I like to call the empty nest the encore season of life, and you get to encore um, some of the best parts of motherhood. Um, but you're not responsible for them day in and day out. And that's really a good thing. Um, my husband and I have been married for 37 years, 27 of them happily. And that is, uh, wasn't 10 bad years, but you know, just over the years, life has been hard. It's been challenging at times. Um, marriage has um, been up and down for us. Uh, it was 10 years ago that we went through a really, really dark crisis. And it was out of that crisis that No More Perfect Marriages was born. And we love now, my husband and I now serve as marriage coaches. And um, that's what we primarily do in ministry. We do that through our speaking, writing, and then we literally coach marriage couples. We host marriage intensives and we love it. That sounds amazing. Will you tell us, you said that you, your marriage had gone through a bit of a crisis season. I know you talk about it in your book, No More Perfect Marriages. Will you fill us in a little bit on what happened and what happened as a result of that? Yeah, absolutely. Well, what happened is um, that my husband was a pastor for 20 years. And in that uh, 20 year time, um, 
you know, ministry was up and down. I mean, it had its challenges. And the last eight years, we were uh, in a church plant, and that was very, very difficult. It was very difficult for him personally. It was very difficult for us as a couple. And uh, so he finally got to the place where he said, I feel like I need to leave ministry before it uh, destroys me. And so he did and uh, launched his own construction business, which is something he'd always wanted to do. But he had no idea how much his, his identity was wrapped up in ministry. And he would have said it wasn't, but until it wasn't there, uh, I saw him begin, he, he'd always struggled with depression to some degree. And I saw him begin to really uh, spiral. And it was in the midst of that spiral that uh, he had an affair. And um, that affair uh, eventually led him to separate. And he was determined uh, that he was going to pursue divorce and that this was what he needed to do to be happy. But as he um, says, when he tells the story, there was one problem. Uh, I took someone with me and that was me. And me was a mess is what he usually says. And, and he was, he was personally in a mess and, um, and no external decision or change in relationship or change in uh, where you live was going to take care of that mess. So it was a dark year. I absolutely did not feel released from the marriage. I continued to pray and, um, and just work on the things I knew I needed to work on. Um, you know, what I like to say is I did not cause our, uh, the affair that my husband had. I didn't cause it, but I contributed to the dysfunction in our marriage. And that was a place that I needed to grow and I needed to deal with and I needed to work on. So I chose to use that dark year to work on me in those places. And then um, on Easter Sunday of 2012, my husband actually had what we call his own personal resurrection, where he literally um, surrendered to God, um, literally like threw up the white flag of surrender and um, made a complete U-turn and left the other relationship and made a decision to, to return to our relationship. Now, he didn't return home to live at home for several months, but we began to rebuild the broken pieces at that point. That is beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I love how you made the distinction also between, okay, you didn't cause it, but then there were things that you contributed because while we don't want to fall into this spiral of saying, you know, I'm a terrible wife and all of these things happen because I'm sure, you know, that's not a healthy or accurate place to be. It is also appropriate to take some, you know, personal responsibility. You can't change him. You're only responsible for you. What can you do? So I want to ask you during this time, which I'm sure was just unbelievably hard. How did you get through it? Do you have any tips that you would share or advice for our listeners today who maybe are going through a very rough season in their marriage? They're praying for a difference. They're praying that God would come through um, and they're just not seeing those results yet. Oh, well, I understand that. Let me tell you, and you're not alone. Uh, once I went public with my story, once my husband and I started sharing about it more and more, um, man, the floodgates opened, you know, and I, I began to realize how many hurting marriages there are out there, which is part of the reason that we love what we do as marriage coaches, because we get to have a front row seat at watching God work and heal and, um, and for uh, relationships to be transformed. But I would say that the number one thing um, for me was um, I had to move my eyes off the mountain and move them to the mountain mover. I mean, I had to stay in tune with um, what God was telling me to do during the, that hard season, that dark season. And it was hard because my eyes kept wanting to go back to the mountain. You know, I, they wanted to look at the, the mess in my marriage. And I had to keep going, no, Lord, I need to keep my eyes on you. And I need to get my marching orders from you. And I'll tell you where God eventually took me is he took me to Romans 12, 9 through 21. And um, it's a powerful set of verses. It's a powerful set of marching orders. And uh, it really helped me to love my husband well, because quite frankly, um, you know, I knew how to love somebody who was loving me back. I didn't know how to love somebody who wasn't loving me back. 
And uh, Romans 12, 9 through 21 taught me how to do that. And that was so transforming for me. And I'll tell you, eventually, uh, my husband even said, I don't understand. I don't understand how you are loving me when I am treating you so poorly. And I remember saying to him, I don't know, Mark, it's unhumanable. And he was like, unhumanable. What does that even mean? And I was like, I don't even know what it, I, I mean, that word just like came to my mind. And, you know, the next day after we had that brief interaction, I went back and I re reread because I was reading Romans 12, 9 through 21 every single day. And um, I wrote in my, in my Bible, the words, this is the formula for unhumanable love. And that was one of the things my husband said really did give him, it began to give him some, a little bit of hope. When people leave a marriage, they have no hope. And I began to realize that I, by looking at what I brought to the dysfunction in our marriage, I needed, I became a dealer of hope in, for my husband. And uh, I had to do that very carefully each and every day. And that meant I watched my responses to him instead of reacting to anything he would say or do, I would respond. You know, I would slow things down like, Lord, okay, show me how to respond to that. I don't know how to respond to that, but show me how to respond to that in an honoring, a God honoring way. And I did not do it perfectly. I will tell you, I remember one night shortly after my husband left, I still had two teenage boys at home. So we had three young adult children in their 20s, two teenage boys at home. And um, the toilet overflowed on the second level of the house. And the water came down onto the first level and even down into our basement. I was not very happy that night being a single mother left to take care of these children and a house. And um, I, I can tell you, I didn't handle it well that night. So I didn't do it perfectly, but I will say that probably 98% of the time I handled things in a way that was different than I had before. Remember when I said I had to look at how I contributed dysfunctionally to the marriage and I had a critical spirit. Um, I was quick to criticize my husband. Um, my words were harsh and I really had to look at those things and I began to make changes and, and change the way I spoke to him, change the way that I responded to him. And that gave him hope. And that really began to rebuild trust for him. Cause you know, when somebody is unfaithful in a marriage, you think that they're the ones that have broken trust and they have, but guess what? I also broke my husband's trust that that our marriage was a safe place for him because of my quick tongue, because of my critical spirit. So I was rebuilding trust with him, beginning to make changes I needed to make that I knew whether my marriage made it or it didn't make it, I still needed to make these changes because they were character issues. They were places God needed to grow me. I love that. And the whole time that you were talking, I just keep thinking about those verses, which I don't know the exact reference off the top of my head, um, but I'm sure everyone's familiar of them with the verses that says, wives, submit to your husband so that, you know, whatever happens, they may be won over by your quiet and gentle spirit. And I feel like that's just such a picture of what that looks like. And as wives, we don't always want to submit to our husbands. We want to be like, no, you treated me wrongly. Like you need to do better and you need to do this and make all of these demands. But that's just such a beautiful picture of this is how it's supposed to work. When you follow God, when you do the right thing, it doesn't matter what anyone else does. It doesn't matter what your husband does. You are responsible for you. You do the right thing and how God can work through that and bless you and bless your marriage. And that's something that I tell to my kids all of the time. You know, when they come to me and say, oh, my sibling is picking on me or, oh, this kid at school did this. Um, okay, you're not responsible for them. You are responsible for you. Did you do the right thing? I'm talking to you. I'm not talking to you about them. I'm talking to you about you. So I just love that that's such a beautiful, like, full picture of, okay, this is what that looks like. This is how you do that. Yes, you're exactly right. And it was, it was that gentle spirit. It was that consistent changed behavior too. You know, I think sometimes we want to say, well, I'll change, but 
you know, what I've learned is once you've broken your spouse's trust as it relates to, let's say, a critical spirit or a, a sharp tongue, and, and in essence, you've made the marriage not safe for, for them, um, you know, we can, we can dump trust in a heartbeat, but we have to rebuild it back. Like, think of it like a bucket of water and the water is trust. We can dump it in a scenario, in a circumstance, but we can only build it back one drop at a time, refill the bucket one drop at a time. And I think what happens is we want to put three or four drops in and go, look, I'm changed. But it needs dozens and dozens and dozens of drops before somebody realizes maybe this is for real. Maybe they're not just manipulating me with a little bit of change behavior. This really is a change that's happening deep inside of them. Yeah. So the next thing I want to ask you, because I know that people are going to be wondering this. So, okay, we understand we have to work on ourselves. We're responsible for ourselves and we are responsible to God for what we do. But do you have any advice for a woman who's in a situation where she feels like, okay, I am holding up my end of the bargain. My husband is not holding up his end of the bargain. I don't just want to sit and pray about it. How can she, in a situation like this, speak to her husband in a way that's kind and loving, but still firm in order to tell him, hey, you need to make a change, or I need this from you, or, you know, something has to be different without coming across as rude or critical or damaging the trust in the marriage. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a good question. So what we have to do is we have to learn to ask for what we need. A lot of times we think we are asking, but we're hinting or we're complaining. And so we we have to um, ask specifically what it is that we need. And if we can do that, especially without huge amounts of emotion, because here's what happens and is oftentimes an emotional person marries an unemotional person. Okay. And so, and I would say 80% of the time, approximately the non-emotional person is the, um, is the husband, the emotional one is the wife. And so um, oftentimes then what happens is the wife gets super emotional to, you know, uh, tell the husband where they're frustrated or what needs to change. Well, the husband can't even hear it because all they see is all this emotion and they want nothing to do with it. So they shut down. So one of the things I've learned is um, the importance of forgiveness before conversation. And so um, you need to forgive your spouse for the way that either they don't show up, for their passivity, for the things that they bring in an unhealthy way to your marriage. Because when you can forgive them and you can go into a conversation with a heart of forgiveness, you really have dialed down some of that emotion. And I'm not saying that emotion in and of itself is bad. Emotion, you have to manage emotion so it's not robbing you of um, the conversation that you really want to have. So that would be the first thing. I think you have some heart prep to go into that. You have some personal heart prep and that will help so that you can actually go into it um, having a conversation. Um, the second part of that though is to, to, to ask very clearly for what you need, what you desire, and what you long for, um, and ask for it in a way that doesn't uh, throw criticism their way. So using I statements rather than you statements. You know, you, you never take me out on a date. You know, somebody might think that I'm communicating to my husband um, if I say, you never take me out on a date. What would probably be a better conversation is, can I just share a little bit of my heart with you? I feel so disconnected. I don't know if you feel that way, but I feel like our marriage is just about diapers and dishes and details. And it's, we've lost the ability to connect on feelings and faith and, um, and, and just, you know, really hearing each other's heart. And I don't know if you feel that way, but I do. And I'm just wondering if you would be open to exploring some things that we could do to kind of get that spark back. That is a way deeper conversation and, a, and it's going to have a way better 
opportunity to be engaged in, then you never take me out on a date. And I'm sick and tired of just being roommates. And so that's, that's what we're talking about in the difference of how you approach it and how you ask specifically for what you need. Okay, so let me ask you this then. Say that somebody is able to have these conversations, they can manage their emotions and come calmly and peacefully, respectfully to their husband and say, this is something that I need in my life um, and make their needs known. What should the wife do if she's in the situation where she's expressed her needs and she like feels confident, I've expressed it clearly, it's not hinting, it's not complaining, this is what I need, and the husband doesn't agree or doesn't follow through. How can she know, okay, this is a legitimate need that I should continue to persist in asking for, or maybe this request isn't reasonable? Because like you said, a bit earlier in our conversation, you said that you love being able to speak with all of these women and seeing like this whole outpouring of all of these women dealing with things when, for me as somebody who doesn't do marriage counseling, like I don't see that on a regular basis. And I'm sure all of our listeners, like the biggest interaction that we have with other people is on social media where everything looks perfect and beautiful. And like they're having all these date nights and they're having vacations and their house is always clean. So it makes it really difficult to know, okay, what is normal? What can I expect? And it just leads to so much second guessing of, am I being reasonable in asking for this? Is it too much? So the question is, and all of that, how do we figure out what to do if we're not sure if our requests are reasonable or they don't agree on where the compromise should be. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I would say is at that point, um, number one, I would ask them if they would be open to getting some help. And, you know, oftentimes it is the wife that wants to get that help first. Um, but there are ways that uh, you can engage in help. You know, some guys are really, in fact, that's one of the reasons we love marriage coaching. Some guys are really intimidated by marriage counseling. But with marriage coaching, it's kind of a couple to couple. And oftentimes they're more open to having a conversation with another couple. So um, sometimes it's asking for help, you know, and, and saying, would you be willing to, um, you know, to engage in a couple of marriage coaching sessions just to see if we can figure out how to get more on the same page. Um, this, but I would say the second thing, and this happens a lot, and that is to examine your own expectations, which you were kind of in your question there. I think you were um, kind of close to that because, you know, you said, is this realistic? Is this a realistic expectation? We really need to examine our own expectations because oftentimes um, what happens is we have unrealistic expectations of our spouse because A, they're a different person and they see life differently, they process life differently than we do, or B, they're a completely different temperament than we are. And so you're longing for something that that will never be them because it's just not the way God made them. And so a, a lot of times we have to examine and, and ask ourselves, do I have unrealistic expectations? And here's when people say that, okay, well, how would I know if I have unrealistic expectations? I would say, where are you constantly disappointed in your spouse? Where are you constantly discouraged and discontent in your relationship with your spouse? And I will tell you that you probably have unrealistic expectations in that part of your marriage or as it relates to him. And that is a, the, one of the best places to start and to go, okay, what is realistic expectations then? What, what's reality? So, you know, my husband will, um, you know, okay, I'll give you an example in our marriage. My husband, actually, we're opposite of the majority of couples. I am the non-emotional one. He is the emotional one. And I long for him to make decisions and to think logically, but he always will um, default to emotion and gut and in intuition before he will look at data. I am a huge data person. Like, you know, if we're going to buy a new car, Okay, I am like looking up um, the gas mileage and I'm looking up the, 
um, you know, the reviews and, um, and the repair records and all of that kind of stuff. Not him. He cares about what color it is. He cares about how he feels in it. And so I could, for the rest of our married life, be frustrated that that man doesn't make decisions based upon data. And he should, because it's the right way. And, and what I'm doing is I will never be content with him because I'm demanding he be like me. The truth is God brought us together to complement each other. And, and sometimes Mark's intuition and his gut on something has no data to go with it, but he knows, I mean, he just has it. He just understands it. And I have to learn how to value that and stop demanding that he do things the way I do them. Guess what? We don't need two me's in this relationship. We, we need, God brought us together to complement each other. So um, a lot of times I think that um, we need to really examine our own expectations. And if we do that, because here's what happens um, for, um, for those that are watching this in the video, you can see this for those in the audio expectation. I've got my, my hand up about my forehead. That's unrealistic expectations. I got my other hand about chin length. Okay. And that is um, reality. The space in between unrealistic expectations and reality is discontentment. And so what we have to do is we have to begin to deal with discontentment. And if we move from, if we move our unrealistic expectations closer to reality, we're getting rid of discontentment. And that is a gift you can give yourself and your marriage. That should be a social media quote. That should be everywhere. Um, I'm going to have to go back and listen to this just so that I can write that down because that is something I'm going to be thinking about all week. Okay, the difference between... I'm going back to get the exact quote. It will be shared. Um, but okay, that I'm going to mull over some more. The next thing I want to ask you, I want to go back to your book because I feel like we have talked so much about all the things marriage and this has just been amazing um, and so much to think about here. But in your book, you talk about the seven slow fades. Can you tell us some more specifically, what are the seven slow fades? What are they? What should we watch out for? Um, and what that has to do with marriage? Yeah. Well, this um, came out of our journey. So let me tell you the story behind the slow fades. Um, we, when we were putting the wheels back on the bus for our very broken relationship, we were traveling an hour each direction to a marriage counselor to help us do that. And um, I'm going to tell you, sometimes those were really long hours if it was a hard marriage counseling session. Um, and one of those hours, um, we we had Christian radio on and the casting crown song came on. It's a slow fade. And there was a, um, there's a, a line of text in that song that says no marriage crumbles in a day. It's a slow fade. And so we got to talking about the fact that, you know what? That's true for us. Our marriage did not crumble in a day. And not only that, we were doing some pretty darn intentional things. Like we knew each other's love languages and we spoke them regularly. And we were going on date nights and we would go away, just the two of us, even while we were raising our kids. So we were doing a lot of the right things on the outside. But underneath the surface of our marriage, these slow fades were happening. And they were little things that we didn't even see, and they were, they were stealing our intimacy one little quarter inch at a time, okay? You don't feel it because it's just this little quarter inch. But we started saying, well, what, if we could label a slow fade, what would we label it? And we started labeling some of the things we were dealing with in our counseling and eventually we started talking with them just to other couples, friends, you know, we'd go to dinner with a couple and we talk about this concept of slow fades and they'd go, oh my gosh, like, I think that I really resonate with this particular one or that particular one. So anyway, the slow fades, and we just talked about one, the slow fade of unrealistic expectations is one. And what's happening is every time you have an expectation of your spouse and they don't meet it, you are a little, you're discontent. And that discontent pulls your heart away from them one quarter inch at a time. 
but you add it to another discontent and another and another and another. And pretty soon your hearts aren't a quarter inch apart. They're now feet apart and then eventually miles apart. Um, the slow fate of minimizing. Um, this happens when one spouse communicates their concerns or their thoughts to the other and they are minimized or when they minimize their own thoughts and feelings. Like I, I'm not even going to say anything because it, my voice doesn't matter. Um, the slow fate of not accepting. This one really works with the slow fate of unrealistic expectations. So I would ask, where are you not accepting your spouse? Where are you not accepting how God has made them? Um, where are you criticizing them for being different and you're viewing it as being wrong? Um, the slow fate of disagreement. This is when we um, don't have good conflict resolution skills and we grow defensive and we don't resolve conflict. The slow fate of defensiveness. Anything our spouse says to us, we disagree with. Or when they bring a concern to us, we're defensive instead of really hearing their heart and, and hearing what they're saying. The slow fate of naivety. This is the one that my husband experienced that led him to infidelity. Um, an old high school girlfriend reached out to him on Facebook. That little Facebook messenger popped up. Slow fate of naivety said, oh, I'll have a conversation with her. It'll be fine. No big deal. But that was naive. We need to protect our marriage. We should not be engaging in a conversation with an old girlfriend. So don't be naive to think, I don't, I don't need to protect my marriage. We have to. And then finally, the slow fate of avoiding emotion. And the slow fate of avoiding emotion was my number one slow fate that I brought to the table. Um, and this is what happens when we avoid emotion is we are not vulnerable with our spouse. We um, really aren't um, emotionally intimate. And so I had to deal with that and recognize um, that I was causing distance in our relationship because I wasn't vulnerable with my husband. I, if I cried, I went to my bedroom and cried alone. I would never let him comfort me um, because I couldn't, I couldn't appear weak. And so I really had to, I had to deal with that one. So those are the, the slow fades uh, that we talk about in No More Perfect Marriages. And they are happening to your marriage. They are. All of them to some degree. So that's why we wanted to help couples to understand, hey, you know, why don't you identify these while your hearts are inches apart rather than miles apart? And then you can actually close the gap so much easier. You can close the gap even if your hearts are miles apart. We did. But what if we can actually help couples do that before the distance is so big that it feels hopeless? So is your book, No More Marriages, more for couples who are just on the brink of divorce, infidelity, and just feels like they're pretty much goners? Or is it more for people who Every are in day. a marriage where it's okay, but it could be strengthened or some of both? I would say both. Um, we've, we, we really wrote it bo with both in mind, but um, I would say more for even the couple that is in a good place. But we want you to know where your intimacy could be eroding and you don't know it. You don't recognize it. For couples that are in crisis, we want you to know why your intimacy has eroded, um, but then also what to do about it. And that's when we introduce what we call the eight God tools. And the eight God tools, when we use them each and every day, when we learn to use them in response to the everyday stuff of life, when we learn to use them, when we bump into each other's imperfect, it begins to stop the fades and close the gaps. And it really um, returns connection and intimacy to the relationship. I love how just practical that this book is. I'm just imagining women in marriages and men in marriages as well. Um, 
oftentimes you don't know what's wrong with your marriage. You just know like we're not as close as we should be or something's off, but I don't really know why. So I can imagine reading through this book, you can say, oh, that one, that's the thing. Like that's what the problem is. And that's what we hear from our readers all the time is they go, oh my gosh, light bulb moment. Like I have a, a word to describe what I've been feeling or we have a word to describe something that we've been dealing with, but we didn't know what it was. And so, yes. Um, and you know, it's been interesting. Uh, we've gotten a lot of couples that are, men are willing to read the book because it has both the male and the female voice. Um, so we, you know, that is the beautiful part of being able to do this as a couple. Um, we love being able to bring that hope to both husbands and wives. Well, I absolutely want to send people to Amazon and I'm sure wherever books are sold in order to get this book, which is going to be so helpful for their marriages. But I know you also have a free four week challenge on your website. Can you tell our listeners some more about that as well? Yeah, we do. Um, in fact, uh, we created this at, to really help couples to also identify some of the dynamics that, um, that they often run into, but they don't understand. So it's actually three marriage quizzes that uh, you, uh, you take as a couple and then you talk about. And those quizzes are um, found through the, uh, the No More Perfect Marriages e-challenge. So you can um, sign up for that at marriagechallenge.jillsavage.org. And um, it is a uh, free, completely free resource, um, but one that we find that couples uh, kind of have a lot of aha moments in, and it helps them to better understand themselves as well as each other. Well, I can imagine that they're going to have so many aha moments and just being able to pinpoint, okay, this is what's going on and this is how we can fix it, especially after this conversation today. That's what I feel like. I'm like, oh yeah, I can completely identify with, yes, that slow fade is probably happening in our marriage and I should probably look into this one and see what's going on there too, just as a diagnostic tool. So, right. And can I add one more thing? Yes. Even if you're the only one who is willing to read the book, and even if you're the only one who is willing to deal with the slow fades in your own heart, and even if you're the only one that is willing to um, apply the God tools, your marriage will change because you will change. And when you begin to change, you're, you're changing one, one part of a two-part element. So it, the dynamic of the marriage will change change. And so even if your spouse isn't willing to engage in, in either reading the book or taking one of our marriage courses or anything like that, you still can bring change to your marriage. Well, thank you, Jill, so much for coming on our podcast today and sharing so much wisdom and so much encouragement. It has been just wonderful to talk to you today. Well, thank you for having me. All right, so that just about does it for today's episode. If you would love to hear more from Jill, either on today's topic of No More Perfect Marriages or any of her other books, including No More Perfect Moms, No More Perfect Kids, or Empty Nest, Full Life, be sure to check out the show notes for this show because I'm going to link to where you can find her website, more information about her books, and the quizzes in the four-week challenge that she shared on today's podcast episode. Just listening through our conversation today, it all looks so amazing and so helpful. So if this is something you need in your life, I would strongly encourage you go ahead, make a note on your phone if you're out and about or go visit right now and find out these resources and how they can help you in your marriage. And otherwise, if you have not subscribed to the Equipping Godly Women podcast yet. Um, as always, what are you waiting for? We come back here every other week or so to bring you more inspiring and encouraging information and interviews to help you be all in in faith and family. And we would love for you to join us. So check out the show notes for more information and subscribe if you haven't already. And we'll see you back here again real soon. All right. Bye.